Five minutes. Thank you. Monsieur le Président, je vous remercie de l'invitation. Je vais faire mes remarques en anglais, mais au plaisir de répondre à vos questions dans les langues officielles. I will skip over an introduction that lays out the uh, infiltration and co-optation of Canadian research by uh, Chinese defense intelligence, national security, and dual-use technology entities, but rest assured that public uh, record shows that it is deep and vast. And in some cases, Canadian institutions and researchers know full well that their Chinese interlocutors are highly problematic. In others, they are unwitting participants. Tax dollars, public research funding, and public universities have for years been leveraged systematically to support and enable research and dual-use technology that benefits hostile authoritarian states that seek to undermine Canada's democratic institutions, electoral processes, economic prosperity, national security, fundamental values, as well as international and multilateral institutions, and so forth. The government purports to have a values-based foreign policy, yet for over 17 years, its own research dollars and institutions have been used by hostile states to advance nefarious purposes that run counter, counter to those very values. This is not a random distribu a distribution problem. Um, the problematic research partners and methods of infiltration and co-optations have been a matter of public record for at least five years, as have the key areas of sensitive research. At the same time, dithering by the federal government on a coherent and systematic approach and framework to contain this problem is anecdotally causing some scholars from being excluded from opportunities merely by virtue of having a Chinese surname. So contrary to the prime minister's claims that government action might have racist consequences or overtones, it is precisely the government's inaction that is having racist consequences by creating widespread uncertainty. Conversely, any scholar who has family in China, who works with former colleagues in the PRC, or who visits China would be vulnerable, as is naturally the case for most scholars with relations to China. So although the committee's focus is on the federal government's role, this domain requires close and extensive collaboration among the federal government provinces and research institutions with robust and resolute federal leadership to ensure certainty and national coherence. To this end, the federal government must not succumb to the temptation to take the easy way out by taking a narrow approach. This would be a serious mistake. Only a consequential approach to research security will be effective and meaningful. One, sensitive research areas. The government needs to flag high-risk research areas, notably in areas that could give rise to dual-use technology. Conspicuously absent from the motion that informs the committee's set of hearings, for instance, is computing or advanced materials manufacturing and critical minerals, which would capture uh, research on electric vehicles. Two, country agnostic. Once sensitive research areas have been identified, the approach would be country agnostic and encompass not just China, but hostile authoritarian regimes more broadly, including Russia and Iran. Listed entities. Three, The government must muster the courage to list problematic entities, which includes about 200 Chinese institutions and companies, but also entities in Russia and Iran, for instance. Researchers must have clarity which affiliations are problematic. Identifying Four, identifying sensitive research areas, problematic countries, and actual entities shift some of the burden for research security to the researcher who should be required to certify in good faith that either none of these apply to the PI and application, or if they do be required to submit a comprehensive research security plan that explains in detail the risks and mitigation strategies, an inadequate research plan should be grounds for rejection. Research security plans must exercise due diligence to ensure that research does not end up in the wrong hands and to provide additional safeguards, including annual audits, and, uh, and uh, possibly withholding funds to research and institutions. Five, a broad, comprehensive vetting process. Instead of then looking only for direct or indirect, that is in-kind financial support for a project, a proper vetting process must look at the principal investigators' collaborations holistically, notably the PI's record of co-author publications and other grants. Looking only at financial support on an application for a project will miss key problematic relationships. Arguments that the charter somehow works against a comprehensive vetting process are false and merely an excuse to avoid doing the right thing. Six, the federal government has started to fund research security at Canadian universities, but there are two problems. One is that the formula used to calculate support under the Government of Canada's Research Support Fund is problematic. Aurora College gets $256 a year, 
Trent, 25,000, University of Toronto, 4.3 million. This is insufficient funding for Trent to hire research officers on the one hand, but way too much money for the University of Toronto. Second, that effort looks largely performative. The new university research officers have thus far received little guidance and are largely performing an administrative function. Okay. They require clear guidance. And seven, universities should be allowed and encouraged to put this new research funding towards research for on uh, towards research, best practices, and awareness in support of research security. Great. Thank, thank you very much.